Hey y'all, my name is Rachel and I'm your friendly neighborhood archivist. Your teacher has asked me to give you guys a little overview of the oldest city in Florida, St. Augustine. And I'm not going to drag out this intro anymore, so let's go ahead and jump into some history. To start, the area we would later call St. Augustine was originally occupied by a people the French and Spanish called the Timucua. Unfortunately, we don't know what they called themselves, but what we do know is that they were split into roughly 35 clans and had widely varied economies based on their immediate environments. Those who lived in the more inland parts of the Florida Peninsula primarily got their food through farming while living in permanently stationary settlements, and those who lived along the coast were more inclined to forage, hunt, and fish for their food while living in more temporary and mobile villages. Because they all spoke the same language, it was pretty easy to trade with one another, but wars and disagreements were pretty common amongst the Timucua. The main chiefdom or clan in our story is called the Saturiwa, and they were a coastal group. And the individual village that we'll be focusing on was called Saloy. You see, clans and villages were named after the chiefs who ruled them at the time, so the village of Saloy was named after the chief who ruled it, who was also called Saloy. Because that's not confusing whatsoever. And if you want to see roughly where Saloy, the village, would have sat today, just go to the Fountain of Youth Archaeological Park in St. Augustine. It may look like a tourist trap, but nope, it's an honest-to-goodness archaeological dig, and they do some pretty good research there, so if you happen to be in the St. Augustine area, totally go check them out. Now our next set of characters are the French. Specifically, these guys are a group of French Huguenots, a group of Protestants who fled mostly Catholic Europe in order to escape persecution. If this sounds slightly familiar, the pilgrims who landed at Plymouth Rock were doing the exact same thing, but the French Huguenots did it first. And finally, we have the Spanish. These are the guys who've been kicking around in Florida since 1513 when Ponce de Leon claimed the place for Spain after getting into a conquistador slap fight with Christopher Columbus's son and promptly getting himself kicked out of Puerto Rico. I'm not kidding. However, prior to St. Augustine, they'd only explored Florida just a little bit and no permanent settlement had ever been established. And now that we have all our major players, we can finally start our story. The man that would eventually go on to establish St. Augustine is the conquistador Pedro Menendez de Aviles. In 1559, he was given the title of Captain General of the Fleet of the Indies, or the Spanish Treasure Fleet, and was allowed to set sail for Florida in order to turn Ponce de Leon's discovery of the Land of Flowers into a formal Spanish colony. And FYI, if you heard the word treasure and immediately thought pirate, you better believe pirates get involved, but don't worry, we will get there. But first, this fellow Menendez was given the primary assignment of kicking the French Huguenots out of Florida because, heck no, that's ours, you heretics. So he takes off from Spain along with about 2,500 other guys and about 30 ships, only for about 600 of them to survive the trip. International travel was no joke in the 1500s. They landed in Florida on August 28, 1565, very close to a Timucua village. You know, the one that is both named for and ruled by a guy named Saloy. Yeah, at first the people in Saloy were totally fine with these weirdos who just landed on their beach. The chieftain, again, also Saloy, even let them use his home as a base of operations, which the Spanish promptly turned into a fort with a 14-foot moat. Bit extra, but okay. Yeah, spoiler alert, this piece doesn't last for long. Meanwhile, at the French Fort Caroline, which is very close to modern-day Jacksonville, René de la Donnelle, whose name I totally butchered just now, had settled into things quite nicely. He'd made friends with the neighboring Tumuqua, the crops were doing okay, and now they were poking around a few miles south of their settlement doing routine patrols. And then, oh no, what is that? That, dear children, would be a very tired, very frustrated, and very very angry Spanish treasure fleet. Yep, the second Menendez caught sight of the Florida coastline, he immediately booked it north because he was sent here to do one thing and one thing only, and that was kick these guys in the teeth. And oh boy, did he do a thorough job of that. Menendez chased the French almost all the way back to Fort Caroline, wrecked the place, and then chased the remaining fleeing refugees right into a hurricane, and those that were lucky enough to escape all of that were cut down by the Spanish. Needless to say, almost none of the French Huguenots survived. 
The inlet that runs next to St. Augustine and a later fort that was built on the site of this massacre was named Matanza, quite literally meaning the killings. Shockingly enough, this is one of the few areas of St. Augustine that isn't reported to be haunted. Now, to be perfectly fair to Menendez, despite being a total jerk to the French, he was pretty fine and cool with being amicable to the Timucua nearest to St. Augustine. Giving them candy, not stealing their stuff, or randomly killing people, you know, basic neighborly stuff. But keep in mind that while the guy running St. Augustine was fine playing live and let live with the Timucua, the common Spanish soldier? Not so much. Turns out that hiring a bunch of people who were planning on coming in and conquering a place in the name of their monarch and money might not make for the nicest neighbors. Shocking, I know. So now, while Menendez is traveling around Florida trying to make friends and allies with the rest of the natives like the Calusa and the other Timucua clans, some of his soldiers are just busy murdering Timucua for their jewelry and food. Remember the chieftain Saloy from earlier? Well, he's back! And very thoroughly done with all of the Spaniards' nonsense. One evening, just a few months after establishing St. Augustine in, remember, Chief Saloy's own house, some Spanish soldiers were out looking to raid some unsuspecting Tamuqua settlement, but old Saloy over here pulled a reverse Uno No You and murdered them instead. Oh, and uh, he also burned down the original fort, aka his old house, just for good measure. So, how does Menendez respond to this? Well, by taking St. Augustine and... And push it somewhere else! Yep, that's right. Menendez moves the city slightly to the west, which is roughly where the Spanish colonial quarter is today. And, being as this area is pretty much the longest-lived part of St. Augustine, the Spanish quarter? Super mega haunted. I mean, we are talking about 10 out of 10 just uh, ghost stories in this part of town. Later, in 1566, Saloy would also kick off another running gag the Tamukua would pull, where they would fire flaming arrows into the thatched roofs of St. Augustine houses, and the first time they did this, their arrows hit the powder magazine, making it explode and burning a good chunk of the city to the ground. Now from here, we're going to try and fast forward through the nine total forts that got repeatedly wrecked over St. Augustine's history. After the city's first encounter with spontaneous Tamuqua assisted combustion, Menendez, presumably after ripping his hair out, went fine and moved the entire city to Anastasia Island and built another fort. For some reason, they decided less than a year later to move it back to the mainland, pretty much to the same spot as it was before, and then they remodeled it in 1571, right before Pedro Menendez de Aviles finally bit it <gasps> and passed his title to his nephew, Pedro Menendez Marquez. Now it's time for round two to Mukua Boogaloo, and in 1577, they burned it down again and built a fifth one in 1579. Then they decided to remodel it again in 1586 before that one got burned down by English naval officer and totally not actually a pirate, Francis Drake. Then in that same year, number seven was built and was even fancy enough to get a shiny new name, San Marcos. Number 8 was built in 1604, and number 9 after a remodel in 1653. These people go through forts like I go through cups of tea. Then St. Augustine, say it with me now, got sacked again by yet another pirate who went either by the name of John Davis or Robert Cyrils, depending on who you ask. Then, after all of that, they finally, about a century after the founding of St. Augustine, built the Castillo de San Marcos. And this thing finally put an end to St. Augustine's terrible luck with forts. The Castillo de San Marcos, along with one other fort left abandoned on Anastasia Island, is one of the few military buildings around the world constructed from a very unique material called coquina. Coquina is just a collection of fossilized shells that have been broken up and forcibly crammed together by the ocean. Think of concrete mixed with a lot of large shell pieces and you've pretty much got the basics of this stuff down. It also has some very interesting characteristics, particularly if you're using this stuff to build a fort. You see, coquina is very soft, much softer than stone, and it actually gouges pretty easily. Now, you'd think this would make for a terrible fort. You want something hard and rigid, so things like cannonballs and bullets just bounce off, right? Wrong. When cut into blocks and stacked into walls thick enough, coquina can turn a typical battle into a Looney Tune cartoon as our good friends the British are about to find out the hard way. 
While St. Augustine was still controlled by the Spanish, the English attacked the Castillo de San Marcos twice, once in 1702 and once in 1740. Both times, the resulting sieges turned into what we historians like to call a hot mess. For example, during the two-month siege of 1702, one frustrated Englishman remarked that the walls of the Castillo will not splinter, but will give way to cannonball as though you would stick a knife into cheese. Many apologies for subjecting your young ears to such a terrible English accent. But yeah, the coquina actually absorbed the shots, preventing the cannonballs from splintering to the point that they could sometimes be reused by the Spanish to fire back at the English. Or at least that was the running joke with the Spanish officers anyway. On top of that, the Spanish decided to really mess with the English by rappelling down the walls of the fort at night and completely repairing the outside facade by filling the holes with plaster. So when the English got up to continue uselessly firing cannonballs into the side of this thing, it looked as if there had been no damage to it at all. The Castillo is not the only place in St. Augustine you can see this fascinating material either. The city gates, the Catholic Cathedral, St. Augustine Lighthouse, and the aptly named Coquina Inn, and the foundations of several of the oldest buildings in the city are all made of Coquina. The English would eventually come to control St. Augustine after the Seven Years' War in the Treaty of Paris in 1763, but they were never able to take the Castillo de San Marcos by force. And this begins the English colonial period of St. Augustine's history. It's also the time period in which the oldest wooden schoolhouse was built. And in spite of its name, it's actually the second oldest still standing structure to ever serve as a school in America. St. Augustine would have likely been the home of the actual oldest if it didn't have so many issues with spontaneous combustion. It was originally built in 1783 by a guy named Juanes Giannopoulos, whose family continued owning it until 1904. It was turned into a school for the children of St. Augustine in 1788, but has also served as a photo and novelty shop before getting turned into the tiny museum you see there today in 1939. One unique architectural feature that the building has today, there's a chain that's actually connected to a giant anchor and wrapped around the entire building. Why is that there? Apparently it's to keep the building from blowing away in a hurricane. I'd question that logic, but it's still there, so clearly it's doing something right. So what was going to school in this thing like? School was a much more rudimentary affair back in those days. You'd learn to read, write, maybe a little bit of math, but in a school this small, you might only have one book for the entire class to share, and schoolwork was typically done on a small tablet with either a piece of chalk or a lead stick to write with. If you decided to get up to some shenanigans and managed to get yourself in trouble with the teacher, aside from just whacking you with a pointing stick, you might be forced to wear what's called a dunce cap, which was a pointed paper hat, and you'd also be forced to sit in the corner in front of the class or if you went to this particular school, you might be put in the dungeon. Don't worry, this wasn't as scary as it sounds. It's just a wooden cabinet underneath the staircase. Kind of like Harry Potter, only way more boring. The family that owned the place lived upstairs, and for a lunchroom, well... The kitchen was a completely separate building set back behind the house. Why was this? Well, because they used an open fire to cook food for most of our history, and we've already discussed how not okay most of St. Augustine's buildings are about fire. And now, with the oldest wooden schoolhouse out of the way, back to the rest of St. Augustine's history. Great, so now Florida's an English colony. Wait, never mind. Less than 20 years into the English owning Florida in 1784, the Spanish came stomping back and said, hey, that doesn't belong to you. Give it back. This begins the second Spanish period that ran from 1784 to 1821, and not a lot happened during this time period. Except right at the tail end when the U.S. busted down the door and said, hey, we're pretty sure the British are going to take over Florida. And the Spanish replied, considering they've done a terrible job of that so far, probably not. And the U.S. replied back, yeah, we just also want Florida. Get out. Spain then presumably heaved a very deep, irritated sigh as the U.S. started a weird mini-war called the Patriots War from 1811 to 1813, which mostly consisted of a bunch of guys led by a fellow named John Houston McIntosh trying and failing to take the city of St. Augustine. 
No joke, when I was researching this, I actually had to double check to see if this guy was real because of how action movie capital A American this guy's name was. Turns out, yep, he was totally real. And I'm still laughing about it. So that's how we got Florida, right? Nope. Because almost as soon as the U.S. started the Patriots War, Britain, still really ticked off about that whole Revolutionary War thing, busted down our door and proceeded to burn down our capital. So the guys that were currently camped around St. Augustine rushed back up to said capital because, oh snap, Washington, D.C. is on fire. Leaving the Spanish just enough breathing room to look around and decide that this was just not worth it. So when the Secretary of State, John Quincy Adams, approached the Spanish about getting Florida without fighting about it in 1819, the Spanish said, yep, you can totally have Florida for $5 million. Adams was like, you serious? Spain replied, dude, yes, please take it. Here, we'll even throw in some Western territory. Just get it off our hands. And now Florida, and by extension St. Augustine, is now a U.S. territory. Hooray! <laughs> Under the rule of the United States, St. Augustine began to blossom into its current form. Vacation City. No, I'm dead serious. Florida's pleasant weather was considered to have health benefits in the 1800s. Back in the days when people thought rubbing crude oil onto their skin helped with muscle aches. Yep. But where you have a bunch of people flocking to a tourist center, you have people that also get up to shenanigans. Sometimes those shenanigans are riding in your fancy chariot being drawn by an actual honest-to-goodness alligator, and sometimes those shenanigans are illegal. Yep, we're going to jail. Prisoners in St. Augustine were originally housed in the Castillo de San Marcos. Then, in the late 1880s, they decided that those accommodations were just too luxurious and built a second jail that only consisted of two cells in the back of a very nondescript building. That building is actually still around today and used to be an old antique shop, but now stands empty. In order to find it, go to number 5 Avile Street, right next to the old Spanish military hospital. However, if you ask a St. Augustinian about the old jail, they'll most likely point you in the direction of the jail that was built in 1891 and stands at 167 San Marco Avenue. It's right down the road from the Dunkin' Donuts, you can't miss it. That old jail was built on account of a fella named Henry Flagler. Good old Henry here was a railroad magnate and is one of the main reasons that St. Augustine and Florida in general is so tourist heavy today, as it was him and his partner's railroads that ran all over the state, connecting to different hotels and resorts. Flagler College is also a building he funded, and this is kind of important because it wasn't always a college. It was originally the Ponce de Leon Hotel, which you might notice is really close to Avila Street, where the actual oldest St. John's County Jail was. Now, the Ponce de Leon Hotel was a really swanky place, and he didn't really want his high-class clientele looking over and having their pretty beachside skyline interrupted by this dinky little jail, and presumably the folks in it. So, he approached the city of St. Augustine about moving it, and unfortunately, as was common back then, they didn't really have the ability to pay for it, much less move it. Flagler then comes back with a $10,000 check, and the city said, all right, we'll move it. This was chump change to a fellow like Flagler. He was one of the richest men in the U.S. at the time, and because he was the one paying for it, he got to decide what it looked like. And he did not want this thing looking like a jail either, no, no, no. St. Augustine was a classy town, so he wanted it to look like a nice, normal, and I use the term normal very loosely here, building. Built in the Romanesque Revival style, which is just fancy art history speak for is absolutely haunted, the builders and designers of this thing were part of an architecture business called the Poly Company. Now, if you don't know who that is, you certainly do know one of the other things they designed and built. Ever heard of a little place called Alcatraz? Yeah, they built that. And if you are at all familiar with Alcatraz, it should not come as a surprise to you that brutality was the name of the game here. Built to house up to 72 inmates, there was no indoor plumbing, baths were taken once a month, and the food consisted of grits, coffee, beans, the occasional green or onion, boiled to the point of being unrecognizable, and for meat, if you were lucky, you had the option of squirrel or possum. I'm going to tell y'all right now, I'm only minimally acquainted with both of these things, and let me tell you, you don't want them. 
The conditions here were very rough, and yes, people did pass away while kept inside the old jail's walls, either from just the terrible conditions or via execution. Thankfully, the last time anyone was executed here was in the early 1900s. Including the Sheriff Joe Perry, well, he passed away while working at the jail. He wasn't executed. I mean, he was the sheriff. How embarrassing would that have been? This guy was so dedicated to his job that he actually lived in the jail with his wife and two daughters and is reported to still haunt the jail to this day. Man, talk about somebody that has no work-life balance. Although I guess it's not work-life balance, it's work unlife balance. Hey! hey. And with that painfully bad joke, that's all we've got for you today. If you did enjoy this, let your teacher know, and I'd be happy to do another little history video for y'all in the future. Hope to see y'all again real soon. Take care! <laughs>